We're now in an environment where there is not a single manufacturing subsector where China is competitive. The cost of labor in China has gone up by a factor of almost 15 since the year 2000, which again, historically unprecedented. What are your thoughts on the potential of, of conflict in the Taiwan Strait, given, given China's serious political and social problems uh, and the general, let's say, general deglobalization going on? Is, is conflict more or less likely, in your view, let's say, in the next few years? Few I years? think conflict is less likely. When a country decides that they want to invade a neighbor, they don't just like wake up on an idle Thursday and throw the switch. Mm -hmm. uh, they plan for it. They build their military around it. It takes years, if not decades, of planning. And in doing it that way, countries have to make certain assumptions that guide their planning as they reshape their militaries for the task at hand. Mm -hmm. In the case of <clears throat> the People's Republic of China, uh, there are four big assumptions. Assumption one is that the war would be easy. And then they look at the Ukraine war and they realize that the Ukrainians only had eight years to prepare, whereas Taiwan has had 45. And you can walk to Kiev, but you have to swim to get to Taipei. So, you know, assumption one's out the window. <laughs> assumption two, Russian weaponry is great. So let's steal all the IP from the Russians, mm -hmm. uh, buy the floor models, reverse engineer them, and then build out our own versions of them and equip our, our soldiers with $3 trillion worth of new gear. And they're now having some serious buyer's remorse because Russian weaponry in the field is just not performing. Uh, assumption number three, no one will care. Once we launch the war, everyone will just stand back, back, let it happen, and then just admit that this is the new reality and they'll just deal with it. The Russians oh, wow. are now under more sanctions than all countries in all regions throughout human history. Mm -hmm. And if you were to take the same sanctions that are on the Russians, put them on the Chinese, oh my God. I mean, mm -hmm. Russia Russia's a flawed system. It's corrupt. It's inefficient. But it's a massive producer and exporter of food and energy. China is the world's largest importer of both, and it imports 80% of the inputs that allows it to grow its own food. You take the sanctions that are on Russia, put them on Beijing, and you get a deindustrialization collapse complete with a famine in less than six months. So everything that the Chinese thought they were preparing for has fallen apart, but it's the fourth one, I think, that really terrifies the Polar Bureau. Mm -hmm. The idea of the boycotts, not the sanctions, just companies deciding to walk away right. from hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in the Russian space, mm -hmm. expecting no compensation, just deciding this is not what we want to be part of. Mm -hmm. There is no concept of citizen agency in mm -hmm. Beijing, certainly not at the top. They don't even have a way to process this. So every assumption that they have made for 40 years, they now know is wrong. And they don't even have the capacity intellectually to start over because they don't have the people who can think outside of the box at all. But there is the issue that you've, you've already mentioned is if, if Xi Jinping gets the idea into his head, is there anyone, anyone there that would you know, say no with the with no. The there is no, PLA. and that is the risk: is that yeah. if 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 Xi or an overeager bureaucrat just decided to pull the trigger just because, the war would happen. It would be the end of modern industrialized unified China. I have mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Yeah. But if you're like me and you think that for demographic, financial, and strategic reasons that the Chinese system is in its final years anyway, then there's something to be said for choosing the time and the place and the nature of the conflict so that you can at least write the local history version of it. And mm -hmm. that might just be enough for the CCP to remain in power. And if you can do that for the low, low price of three to 500 million dead Chinese, it just might be worth it. Yeah, it's a scary thought. I recently saw a video of yours where you discussed how uh, the U.S. Is, uh, is slowly sort of pulling away from this global, uh, the global trade order that's been established over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and you mentioned that it might take a, a serious national security scare that would bring, sort of bring U.S. interests back towards an idea of like, we need to keep our investment in this global order. Would Taiwan meet that criteria if, if there were a, a conflict? I don't think so. If we have a war in Taiwan, 
Mm -hmm. obviously the world is going to lose its top end semiconductors, but that's a relative, the, the, the 10 nanometer and smaller semiconductors that Taiwan dominates, you know, it's 80% of production mm -hmm. globally. It's a small sliver of the market. Uh, you're talking about less than 5% of the total and that we're probably going to lose anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things about semiconductors that most people don't realize is the degree to which it's an ecosystem. So the wafers, as a rule, come from Japan, and some of the machinery from Korea, and the designs from the United States, and the lithography from the Netherlands, and the lenses for the lithography from the Germans, and the lasers for the lithography from California. You get the idea. Yeah. It, it takes a village. Okay. And if one piece of that falls out, Taiwan's done. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's no one out there who can replace it. This is the result of 50 years of industrial specialization in a do mm -hmm. dozen different locations. There's no backup. That's one of the reasons why when the Biden administration decided to kill the Chinese semiconductor sector, it was so easy because mm -hmm. it only took one country removing support. And now with the Dutch and the Japanese online, it, it's three. So, you know, it really is over. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's an asterisk there. There's, you know, papers that you can write on the details. Yeah, yeah. But this sort of environment that allowed us to push the boundaries where Taiwan was the forge that brought all these pieces together, this was never going to last. Okay. Uh, so the Taiwanese semiconductor industry in its current form will not last regardless of the overall American position. Okay. Uh, so, you know, enjoy it while you can. Mm -hmm. And always keep in mind, you can use top end fab facilities to make non top end wafers right. and semiconductors. So it's not that semiconductors are going to vanish from Taiwan, but the pushing the boundary as we have have become used to associating Taiwan with, that is very close to the end and was going to be close to the end, regardless of what happened with the United States or a war with Taiwan, or, or excuse me, a war with China. Um, hmm. For the United States to be sufficiently scared to pick up the mantle of global leadership again, it's got to be something that can th theoretically hurt the mainland. So 9-11, of course, was the excellent example, because if it wasn't for 9-11, we would have been on this path 15 years ago. Makes sense.